Romans and chapter 1. The book of Romans in chapter 1, and we're going to commence reading here from verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Paul the Apostle is the, is the writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Amen. And we want to thank God for his precious word. And may the Lord bless it to all our hearts. I want to speak tonight about what society has lost sight of today. What society has lost sight of today. And before I preach on this, I just want to pray and ask the Lord's help. Father, thank you for your precious word. And thou knowest, Lord, this subject that we're going to deal with now. And I ask my Father for that gracious enabling and the precious anointing of God the Holy Spirit as we seek my Father to bring thy word uh, before this congregation, Lord, and even for others who will listen at a later date. We pray in Jesus' name that the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, will be upon this message. And Father, thou will use it to accomplish thy great plans and purposes in the days that lie ahead. And so, my Father, undertake for me thy servant. Fill me afresh, I pray, and bless us to your glory and use us for the furtherance of thy great kingdom. For I do ask it in Jesus' precious 
and worthy name. Amen and amen. What society has lost sight of today? We are in a very deep declension, spiritual declension in church attendance, in Sunday schools, in religion, in faith in general. And this primarily has really come to the head now in our day and generation. I think we could say there's been a great spiritual declension from the uh, middle 50s to the 60s when the great uh, wave of pop music and modern culture started to sweep into Britain. This was a land that was mightily blessed of God, particularly under the reign of Queen Victoria when there were the average church attendance could have been as many as 60% of the nation. But today, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's certainly very, very low as regards to those that attend a regular place of worship or have any great interest in the things of God. And the result of that is because over the, the decades, God has been withdrawing his presence gradually. And you find that that is symptomatic of God's judgment. When God comes in judgment and people don't respond to his word, that eventually and gradually God lifts his hand off a nation. And as we read here in this book of Romans, it comes to the stage where God gives them up, where they want to go their own way and do their own will, where there's no restraints. And it comes to the stage then where God has completely lifted his hand off and he's released judgment upon the land. And this has been a gradual process, I believe, uh, over the years. Now, I'm only saved 30 years, and some of you are saved a lot, lot longer than I am. And you could tell me stories upon stories in your early years when the Spirit of God was mightily and powerfully at work. It's not that we as preachers in one sense are doing anything different as regards preaching and bringing the word of God. Salvation is of the Lord. The conviction of sin and of the heart is the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we can do. It's something only God can accomplish. And we need God's presence to be moving in our midst, in our land, and in our nation for for God's word and work to be accomplished. And because the Spirit of God is withdrawn, we are not seeing the evidence of that. Now, granted, there are little pockets here and there where the Spirit of the Lord has been pleased to move and been pleased to bless. I have experienced that personally in individual places where we have went and taken missions, and it seems as if God come with a little a touch of spiritual awakening on and many were saved, but it's, it's quite unique now in that sense where there's, there's a deep manifestation of God's presence on the move of the Holy Spirit. So we are in deep spiritual declension. There's no doubt about that. And society generally today is in a very, very low ebb. And in 2020, as we head into this next uh, decade, the nations are on tender hooks. Even this last number of days in relation to what has happened in the Middle East, it's like a box of matches and it wouldn't take much for the whole thing to explode. And dear friends, only knowing that God is on the throne, these are fearful days. But bless God, we know that the Lord is sovereign and he's working all things out in his own purposes and plans. And those that are in authority, whether you like them or not, God has raised them up for such a time as this. So I believe then that God has slowly lifted his hand off the land, particularly Northern Ireland, which has been known as the land of saints and scholars, a land that has been so blessed and owned of God down through the centuries. And as we look tonight at some of these relevant aspects of what society has lost sight of, 
the first thing as I was thinking about this, and actually this message came as I was lying in bed one night. I do some meditating when I'm lying in bed. Maybe Monty thinks I'm snoring, but I do a wee bit of meditating and I do a wee bit of thinking and reflecting and it's as if the Spirit ministers to me. And one of the things that came to my mind and I have a little book at the side of my bed and I would write things down in it when they come to me. And here's some of the some of the revelations that the Lord gave to me. What society has lost sight of today is the belief in God as creator. People don't acknowledge today, and not everyone now, but the majority of society does not acknowledge God as creator. Our nation is filled with atheists and humanists and agnostics, people who are so opposed and resistant to anything to do with the culture, if you like, of God or the sovereignty of God or the place of God in the nation. And they don't want that sort of preaching. They don't want that kind of talk. They don't want it brought into schools, into government. They want God out of society. And this is what is happening. There's a great wave today of humanist culture where God should be totally banished from society, particularly in Great Britain. And they they don't believe in God as the creator. The atheist, well, he doesn't believe in the existence of God at all. The agnostic, he says, well, that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God. And what they've done today is they have replaced creation, God the creator, and they've put in its place evolution. That evolution is the answer and the great cause of all things, that there is no creator, everything evolved. Evolution, it evolved. The process of time where things develop, become smarter, become cleverer, until eventually you get the human race. If you listen to all the, the, some of these wonderful nature programs, they're truly amazing. I was watching a little program the other evening on Madagascar and about the wonderful animals there and about the monkeys and all the different um, lizards and so forth. Truly amazing. If you listen or if you watch that television program with the volume off, you see the great creator's handiwork, God in creation. If you listen to it with the volume on, You're listening to the biggest load of propaganda that you ever heard. It's all evolution. It all evolved. It's all by chance. You need more faith to be an evolutionist than you do to be a Christian. But this is what is happening in society today. And take, for instance, the very fact that it's global warming All these catastrophes that are happening are an act of God's judgment. They're an act of God's judgment. Yes, there's been freak floods over the years, but what we are seeing today is not freak floods. What we are seeing is supernatural judgment of God. God is judging the nations. God is speaking, but unfortunately man is not listening. And how the devil is counteracting that is he is telling the nations it's global warming. Well, I have news for them. The Lord is going to burn up the earth. He has said that in Second Peter, for the heaven shall pass away with the fervent heat and the earth itself, it's all going to melt. But I have an answer for the nations to put out the fires, to stop the floods and the turbulence. Seek God. Australia tonight is burning from coast to coast. It's unnatural. It's a supernatural event. Pray for the nation. Pray for the people. Pray for the Christians. But God is judging the land. They brought in gay laws. They've demolished the word of God. They've banished God from their coasts. And now that the fires have come, God's to blame. Dear friends, the answer to get the fires out is seek the Lord. I don't hear anyone, their prime minister, anybody in the land calling for a day of prayer. 
asking God to come an intervention to Australia. The Prime Minister has said these fires could be raging for months. Leadership seeks God. True leadership seeks God. It's absent today. God is absent from society. The true and living God, Australia, that, that knows the true and living God and has a history of evangelical awakening. But yet tonight, the nation is not seeking God. They're burning. Friends, that's a sovereign act of judgment. God's judgment comes slowly because he's gracious. And he gives the nation a time to repent, like Israel. He sent them prophet after prophet, word after word, event after event, till eventually he sent the Babylonians and he sent the Assyrians to take them into, into exile. God's judgment falls. And so, sadly, the belief in God as creator is absent from society today. And evolution has taken its place and technology and science have replaced God, sadly to say, even from our schools, the absence of God in society. I can't understand sometimes how these great intelligent men with all their tremendous intellect believe in the basis of evolution that all of this evolved over a period of billions of years. My dear wife made a very interesting statement as we looked at all the different little monkeys. She says, you know, out of all the years, she says, they haven't evolved anymore. Somebody has put the brakes on in evolution. What could happen? What could have happened that? Reminds me of the story. It's a little bit funny, but yet it's not funny. Where this, this young man, his parents were Christian missionaries, and they'd been missioning out for the Lord, and for whatever reason, he, he wasn't a Christian, and he was very antagonistic to Christian work and witness. And uh, I was uh, building a house for him, and he was no time for the Lord whatsoever. Isn't that amazing? And that's a warning to, to missionaries. You can win a nation and lose your family. You need to be careful. And lo and behold, uh, a number of years later, he introduced me to his little baby son. And he was only a few months old, and he was, oh, he was just such a proud father. And I brought to his remembrance what he said to me when I tried to witness to him about God. And I looked at the little baby, and I looked at him, and I says, it's hard to believe that come from a monkey. And he got the message right away. We didn't come from monkeys. We come from the heart of God. Society has replaced God with evolution. And of course, that, that's easy then because if there's, if there's evolution, well then, sure, there's, no, there's nothing to worry about. There's no judgment or anything like that. And this book is just a book of fables and fantasy for fanatical Christians who believe in some supernatural power up in the skies, high in the air. And that satisfies many tonight who have no belief in God, the true and living God. What society has lost sight of today, the fear of God, the fear of God. As a young boy growing up in a little village, I always had a fear of God. That's a healthy thing, very healthy to have a fear of God. Today, the younger generation, they'll burn churches, they'll burn mission halls, they'll deface uh, houses of worship. There's no fear of God in their eyes and there's no fear of God in their hearts. And the problem is because there's been a generational gaps. There are many, gener there's generations today who have never been to Sunday school, who don't know what church, inside of a church building would look like, who know nothing of the great stories of the characters of the Bible. They wouldn't know who Daniel is. They wouldn't know about Samson or David or any of the great kings of Israel. They have absolutely no biblical knowledge. And in many schools, it's not taught for fear today of reprisals and repercussions. And so this young generation that's growing up has no knowledge of the true and living God where God clearly states in his word, teach it to your children and to your children's children. 
And because of the generational gap, there's tremendous lawlessness abounding in the land because there's no fear of God amongst the young people. They've no fear of God in their hearts. And uh, we read that tonight in Romans 1 and 26 as well. There's no fear God has given these people up, many of them, because they've no fear of the Lord. And friends, that's what we need in our land, restored that, that reverential fear of the true and living God. It's great to see a man or a woman under conviction of sin. How do you explain that? What could make a young man of 28 years of age tremble in his boots, shake uh, in contrition of heart, be so convicted that he's weeping and broken? What could do that? Only the spirit of the true and living God. That's what's absent in our churches today. We used to, we used to rejoice as Christians, didn't we, when the unsaved people uh, would have got wonderfully saved, we would have rejoiced, would have said, you know what, there was three got saved in church last night or one got saved in church last night. It was a, well, we had a mission and people got saved. It was absolutely wonderful. Now we're rejoicing if unsaved people even come into the church at all. We're rejoicing in that. Where in years ago there was tent crusades there was missions that were filled with, with unsaved people who had a fear of God and a respect for the Lord and were out in God's house listening to his precious word. And the servants of God were endued with power from on high. They lived holy lives. They were in touch with God. They were true servants ministering the word in holiness and in righteousness and in truth. They were men of integrity filled with the Spirit and in fear of God themselves. Friends, it's absent today from, from many pulpits and from many so-called houses of God. It's not there today. The fear of God has been replaced in many places with entertainment. Sad to say. And God, the Holy Spirit, is called the Holy Ghost dispenser and God is your buddy and Jesus is your friend. Friends, we have, we have lost this reverential fear. And if the Christians have lost the fear of God, what do we expect the unsaved to have? If we don't have any fear of God, they'll not have any fear of God. They don't see it in us. And that is a fact that society has lost sight of the fear of God. But also has society lost sight of the sacredness of life. The sacredness of life. Dear brothers and sisters, we are unique. We're special. We are created in the image of God. In the image of God, he created us, male and female, created thou them. That makes us unique. That makes us special. And that's why God commanded life for life, tooth for tooth, not to take man's life, shed man's blood, because we are made in the image of God. And the very fact that there's no, the sacredness of life. Do you know in Northern Ireland last year there were 21 people murdered? And we live in the day of the peace process. This is not the day of terrorism. This has been a new beginning. Is it 30 years? I believe it is, and the trouble's ended. I stand to be corrected. But we live in this, they call it dispensation of peace. Northern Ireland's a small province of six counties. 21 murders. People who have been brutally murdered. 21 people. Some of the most brutal and horrendous murders. We well, think of that dear school teacher up there in Crumlin where a man went for money for drugs and attacked him and killed him with a hatchet. And after that, stole his money and went down to the Chinese and bought himself a meal. My goodness me. Horrendous. 
the sacredness of life, murder. Life's precious. And that is one of the reasons today why abortion is being introduced. Because life is not precious in the eyes of many now. In fact, they call it the product of conception. Whenever a woman was expecting a little baby, everybody rejoiced. Now, not everybody falls into this category, I know. But uh, the mainland Britain has now enforced a law upon this land where we have the most grotesque abortion laws in the world, where a baby can be terminated up to nearly, what, 28 weeks. It's absolutely horrendous. There are children who have been born premature at 24 weeks and are living outside the womb, perfectly formed, a precious little baby. But now, of course, deal with the psychology, deal with the mind psychologically. If you tell a man or a woman something long enough, tell them a lie long enough to believe it. You're just a product of conception. You're something that's been produced. You're not valuable. We had Cecil Andrews here in this pulpit who spoke, spoke one evening on abortion on God's word. And dear friends, how contrary, contradictory it is to take life. The mother doesn't have the right to take the life for it's not hers, it's God's. And I would agree with that. There are, yes, in certain circumstances <clears throat> where perhaps it's the only option to save the mother's life or whatever. We're not decrying that, but as regards abortion, over 80% of abortions are for social needs or individual needs of the person, unwanted pregnancies. Tragedy, tragedy. The sacredness of life, murder, abortion, and even terrorism. And look what's happening worldwide today in relation to terrorism, where car bombs are going off and slaughtering hundreds. We know all about that. Here in Northern Ireland, we have had our fair share of terrorism. Many soldiers, policemen, um, those in serving in various forces and prison officers and so on, UDR, even civilians have been caught up in terrorism and lives have been taken so cheaply. Dear friends, what a tragedy. And this has all been on the increase as we are now in 2020, the sacredness of life. What society has lost sight of? The sacredness of marriage. The sacredness of marriage in society today. Marriage is <coughs> constituted of God, ordained of God. We read that in Genesis 2.24 that a man uh, uh, shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto thy wife and the two shall become one flesh. And so marriage has been replaced uh, today in many places uh, by contracts and partnerships. And uh, there are so many different partnerships, bisexual partnerships, uh, same-sex marriage partnerships, all sorts of partnerships. Really what they are is contracts. But the lovely thing about God's marriage, marriage is unique to, to God's children. Marriage is unique because God ordained it. He ordained it one man and one woman. That is the true definition of marriage. Whatever label others want to place upon it, God has ordained it so. And a marriage in the eyes of God is a covenant. It's not a contract. You hear about people entering into so-called a marriage with a prenuptial agreement. In other words, if you marry this individual and he has plenty of money, and you divorce him then, and the signed on the bottom line is you don't get any of his assets or any of his wealth. Safety, get out clauses, prenuptials. Dear friends, in marriage it's a covenant that two become one, one flesh. And marriage is for life. The Lord Jesus himself preached about divorce. Marriage is for life. It's not like that today. Society is filled with divorce and separations and anything goes, the sacredness of marriage. That's what society has lost sight of today. And also, I believe, and we read of it here, 
the absence of thankfulness. The absence of thankfulness. You know, when we start and come to the place where we don't appreciate our value, what we have in society, we are in a very bad place. And we live in such an unthankful society today with such unthankful generation. You know, all to complain about uh, is the moaners, the complainers, and the grumblers. All this negativity in society. The fine problem with the NHS. Problem with the jobs. Problem with family, with health, with DHSS. And when you think about society in which we live, if you were to go back 120 or 30 years, go back to William Booth's day, when children are, uh, were, were, were in such uh, places of poverty, and think how far we have come as a society, we think somehow that, that we're entitled to all these benefits. People live off benefits as a lifestyle which are there to support and to help, and we know people that need that. But the point I'm making is it's not there for, for as a lifestyle, it's there as a help. And people become unthankful. And this is what we read here in God's Word. It says that they became unthankful because, verse 21, that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And when you become unthankful, you go down, you start to go down the spiral and you start to go down and down when you become unthankful. That was one of the reasons uh, that God was, was angry with the children of Israel. They were grumblers and moaners and complainers. Uh, and God brought judgment upon them. He sent fiery serpents to bite their heels, to poison them, and to kill them because of their moaning and their grumbling and their complaining. God hates it instead of being thankful for what we have. And we live in, in such an ungrateful society today. Instead of thanking God for what we do have, we seem to grumble about what we don't have. And each and every one of us, we all have warm homes today. There are very few, apart from a number that are homeless and even the government are doing their best to meet that need. And we thank God that we live in a land where uh, we know so much prosperity and have so much wealth. Uh, Port Rush, Port Stewart is a place of second homes. If you're driving around some of those uh, housing uh, developments tonight, they're all be in darkness because they're all second properties. We live in a land and a nation of affluence, of great wealth. And also there are areas of great poverty. But society has forgotten God and to be thankful. And very quickly, what else has society lost sight of? The blessings of past awakenings. The blessings of past awakenings when the Spirit of God moved in Great Britain and in Northern Ireland. Uh, Mandy got me a lovely book there over Christmas for to read and I'm going to start reading it soon on church history and I'm looking forward to it and when we think about how uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland how we were blessed with uh, periods of spiritual awakening you know there's nothing new under the sun and uh, where we are today the nation has been here before there's nothing new about homosexuality. The Romans, the Greeks, they practiced it. They wallowed in it. They lavished it on themselves. For them, it was just day-to-day, -day living day-to-day -day society. We're shocked at some of the things that are happening today. The only thing is what the Romans didn't have, what we have, is an advance in science and technology. But as regards the human heart, it hasn't changed one bit. It's still the same today as it was in the days of Ashtaroth. That's why the Lord drove out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites. They were into all of the perversions, child sacrifice. It's all there in the Word of God. There's nothing new. But God came with a mighty visitation and with a mighty awakening. And He visited us here uh, through one of the greatest awakenings was the Reformers. We read here in God's Word tonight in verse 17. 
the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther, that Catholic monk, God spoke to him. He was a man trying to please God by indulgences, by paying into the church, by seeking to be good, by seeking to live a right life before God. And no matter what he did, his sin came before him. And God gave him a revelation that the just shall live by faith. On the 19, or in 1517, on the 31st of October, he nailed his 95 theses on the door there on Wittenberg, and the Reformation was born. Martin Luther, the forerunner of the Protestant Reformation, the protesters against the indulgences, which was raising money to build the Vatican in Rome, and Martin Luther sought God and God gave him a revelation. And it's not wonderful tonight to know that if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. And as a result of men like Martin Luther, uh, Swingley, John Calvin in Geneva, Swingley in Switzerland, John, John Knox in Scotland, the Huguenots in France, there was over 2,000 Huguenots slain in France. Any wonder it's a dark nation today. They put out God's light. They slew 2,000 Huguenots in Paris alone. 22,000 of them were slaughtered and they had to flee to England. Dear friends, it's absolutely amazing how God has blazed a trail. He used John Knox in Scotland. Queen Mary said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than any man, a man in touch with God, a man that knew the power of God and God was moving mightily through the land of Scotland. Presbyterianism was born. John Knox, the great mighty reformer, an instrument in God's hand. And sadly today, society doesn't know our church history. We need to be retaught. We need to be re-educated. That's the problem today. We don't know our history. I'm guilty of that myself. We need to know our church history. John Knox, Patrick Hamilton, Tyndale, even in Oxford. I remember being over with Mandy when we were visiting our son Christopher when he was doing his studies in Oxford University. And there up at the top of Broad Street is the great memorial uh, with um, Latimer and Ridley and Kramer. On that memorial there in Oxford, you'll see it at the top of Broad Street. And just halfway down Broad Street on the left-hand side, there's a big sandstone plaque in the wall. And it says, opposite this plaque, on the center of this road, and there it is in white bricks across, it says, Thomas, uh, Kramer, Ridley, and Latimer were burned at the stake for their faith. And uh, Kramer said, tell him, play the man. For this day we light a fire in England that will never be extinguished. Those men were burned at the stake for their faith in Jesus Christ and for the word of God that we have today. We need to be re-educated about our church history. Society has lost sight, dear friends, of the word of God, the truth of God's precious word. Society doesn't value the Bible anymore the way it ought to. It doesn't get the preeminence in God's house. The reason I read the Word of God every Sunday morning here before we commence the service is because it's the power of God. It's the power of God. It's, it's God's Word. It's alive. It's powerful. It's quick. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The power of the Word can heal. God sent us forth His Word and healed them. The power of the Word can come with assurance. The power of the Word can come to meet your needs spiritually. The power of the Word can come with encouragement. It can come with quickening. It's not necessary to hear my voice, but it is necessary to hear the Word of God. And this is why it's paramount in this church, central in this pulpit, because it's the true and living and inerrant word of the true and living God. And we revere it, we respect it, we love it, and we preach it. It's so important to me, and it's so important to you, and it's so important to God. And that's why we love it. It's the precious, precious, inerrant word of God. And society does not value God's word today. And dear friends, that's one of the reasons why he's, he has lifted his hands off restraint. Because they who knew not God chose not to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, what he's saying is, you don't want me. 
You don't want me in society. You don't want me in the schools. You don't want me in your home. You don't want me in your life. God, give them up. God, give them up. And God's word is saying this here, and he's reminding even tonight the reasons why all these catastrophes are happening in our world today because God has withdrew his hand. There are still many missions. When is the last time we heard of a move of God, a genuine, genuine move of God, the Holy Spirit, where people were weeping in conviction of sin? When was the last time we were in meetings where the presence and power of God was so strong that we couldn't leave it? When was the last time we were in meetings that the power of God was so strong that we were afraid to speak, we were whispering in his presence? When we need days like that, we need God to rend the heavens and to come down and move in our society. What about our children? What about our grandchildren? What about our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones? Tonight, friends, they're in darkness. They're in death. They're separated from the love of God. They don't know God. They've no interest in God. They've no thought of God. Society is bereft of God's presence tonight, and the judgment is upon the land. We need to be thankful for the little that we have and the blessings of past awakenings. And we think of those glorious revivals that God sent over the years. John Wesley, here we are in a Methodist church in 1739. John Wesley was uh, gloriously saved. He said at the, uh, at, the, at the meeting that he was at in the evening time, he says, I felt my heart strangely warmed within me. He was away over in America trying to convert the Red Indians. A man called as he fell to the ministry, wanted to share God's word, not saved himself. And coming back over the sea, he was in a boat and the waves were tossing it. They thought they were going to drown. And up at one end of the boat were these Moravian people sitting quiet, praying, unperturbed. And John Wesley couldn't understand why these precious people weren't anxious or fearful for their own life. And one of them challenged them, Mr. Wesley, are you saved? And he said he was, but he knew in his heart it was a lie. And that really stirred him. And the Moravian shared with him the simple message of the gospel. And John Wesley started on his pursuit of God. And what a mighty soul winner he was. His mother, Susanna, who brought up all those children, 17 of them, who spent an hour with them every day teaching them to read the word of God. What a role model mother she is. And dear friends, John Wesley, when the house went on fire, they made a chain and lay up their thatched roof and pulled him out of the window. And his mother was the last to grab him. And she says, here he is. She called him Jackie. Uh, a brand plucked from the burning. And how God raised up John Wesley and his brother Charles. And what a mighty trail they blazed for God. What a mighty... God doesn't raise up committees. God doesn't raise up denominations. God fills men and women with the Holy Ghost and blazes a trail. God only needs one man or one woman and he can commence a movement that can astound the masses. He did it and he has done it down through the years. It seems to be God's pattern, seems to be God's way. In Wales, Howell Harris, uh, Griffith Jones, Daniel Rowlands, George Whitfield, mighty men of God, powerfully and awesomely used of God. George Whitfield preaching to masses, thousands of, thousands of people at one time and hundreds upon hundreds getting saved through one simple gospel message. What is it? Is it the persuasion of the preacher? Is it the eloquence of his speech? Is it his uh, charismata? No, dear friends, it's the presence and the power of God that brings salvation to souls and nothing else. John Wesley never saved. No man ever saved. Salvation is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one responsible by the Holy Ghost for bringing conviction to the heart and bringing an awakening to the soul. And that's what's absent in society today. We need a move of God. And uh, dear friends, just in closing, we come to our own little land here. Away back in 
uh, 18 and 59. When not that far, what, maybe 30 miles, 35 miles up the road, when that little place, that wee schoolhouse in Kells, with those four little men gathered with a handful of turf and a blessed book of God. And there they prayed and they waited on the Lord and they called upon God. There had been a mighty spiritual awakening in America in 1857. George Muller's journals had been coming back and they, those, that man, David McQuilkin and his friends, they gathered, they read the journals of the awakening and they said, Lord, if you can do it over, the, over on the Atlantic, on the farther side of the sea, Lord, you can do it here. And they gathered, just four of them. You know, we'll have an opportunity this week to gather. Not round a turf fire, but in a nice little warm, a little warm hall. We have the same book they had. We have the same Bible they had. The same Bible that the reformers had. It hasn't changed. It's God's inerrant word. And we can read it. And we're going to pray to the same God, to the same Savior, by the same Holy Spirit, who has the same gracious and glorious power to move and to awaken again. And as a result of them, men's prayers, little things, despise not the day of little things, ones and twos started to come to Christ. The Spirit of God started to graciously move. And all of a sudden, there was a great, mighty awakening. And the Presbyterian churches were filled. The Word of God was preached. People were saved through the reading of the Scriptures alone. Never mind the preaching of the Word. The presence and power of God is at work. Dear friends, this is what we need in society. In 1859, can you imagine people outside Marks and Spencers and outside Bob and Bert's falling in their faces, weeping and crying, what must I do to be saved? Could you imagine such a thing could happen again? I can. For God is able. God is able. We think of W.P. Nicholson in the 1920s. It says of him that he's the man that averted civil war in Northern Ireland. When he preached the glorious gospel, George said he, he heard him himself. He, he, he was in his meetings. That man can tell us from experience about the presence and power of God in those services. Was it W.P. Nicholson that saved? Not at all. They say the tour, the, the, the little songbooks into flitters. They were under such conviction of sin when the Spirit of God got a grip and a hold of a man's heart. That's God at work. That's what we need today. No long appeals, no pleading for souls, no seeking to encourage and to entice people into the kingdom. No, dear friends, we need the presence and power of Pentecost. We need a fresh spiritual awakening. It's the only thing will save our society. It's the only thing will save our children. It's the only thing will save our land. It's the only thing will save our nation. It's the only thing will save the nation of Britain is a fresh move of the Holy Ghost and God is able. And that, my friends, is what society needs today. And we can have a part of that. We can pray for it. We can ask God to come to intercede to do it again. The last great awakening of God in the British Isles was in the, is the outer Hebrides on a little island called Lewis. 1949, when Duncan Campbell went, when the place was saturated saturated with prayer. And two little sisters in their 80s, one hunched over with arthritic pain and the other blind. And one got a vision from God. And she's seen a strange man in the pulpit in Barvis. Strange man in the pulpit on the church filled with young people that she was so burdened for, for there was an absent generation like there is tonight. Where's the teenagers here? There's not one. An absent generation. And this woman was burdened. And the Lord gave her a vision. One person, a vision. And she gathered the, the elders and the minister around and she asked the minister to pray. She says, I believe God wants to do something in the parish will you pray? And he was a man of God and earnest to see God working and God moving in the community. And he said, we'll pray. We'll pray on a Tuesday night and we'll pray on a Friday night. 
And the two sisters says, well, if you do that, we'll pray from 10 o'clock in the night to 4 o'clock in the morning. Hallelujah, boys, if we could get a lot of prayers like that. And they sought the Lord. And nine months later, the power of God came and visited Barvis. Duncan Campbell says he was called for 10 days and he was there for three years. That's God. That's the last great spiritual awakening there's been in the British Isles. It's time, Lord, for thee to work, for they have made void thy law. You know, dear friends, God is not willing for any to perish, but that all would come to repentance. I'm holding on to the promises that God has given to me. And the Lord says, the days of visitation are come, and I'm longing for those days. Oh, I'm longing for those days when we'll see the true and living God take the field again, moving by the power of his Holy Spirit. Let me share this with you just in closing. Something interesting. It may bless some of you, it may not, but it certainly <coughs> blessed me. There was a prophecy. There was a prophecy by a man called Smith Wigglesworth a week before his death in 1947. He predicted there'd be two great developments in the universal church. He said, one, the first would be the restoration of the gifts of the Spirit. The second would be a revised emphasis on the Word of God. And then he added, when these two moves of the Spirit combine, we shall see the greatest move the Church of Jesus Christ has ever seen. And friends, that's what we need. What he's speaking of there is the Acts of the Apostles. When the Lord moved in mighty power, signs and wonders, genuine, authentic, Holy Ghost inspired signs and wonders and healings and miracles combined with the Word of God. The Word of God. Do you remember I preached here in the church about Joshua and Caleb? Joshua, a representation of the Word of God, and Caleb, a picture of the Spirit of God. There to Vishkal, they bore the spiritual fruit. Take away the Spirit, the fruit falls. Take away the Word, the fruit falls. But together is the power of God. That's what we need, dear friends, in our day and generation, because we live in a generation of technology and of science. Man is so advanced today and only a supernatural, authentic move of God will turn the tide of sin, demolish and defeat the devil and revive the land with spiritual awakening and fill the churches to the glory of God with a generation that will faithfully seek Jesus Christ and turn God's wrath and bring God's mercy. Amen. May the Lord bless this word tonight till all our hearts and for his glory alone we pray. Amen.